Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to teacher learners and our facilitators for the second day of the SIPSA PYP Job Alike at Neve. Yesterday, across platforms, we had close to 2,000 people logging in. A community is more than a gathering of people, and being online shows us a pathway to consolidate this community. COVID reminded us that the world doesn't need change because of our opinions, but it does because of our actions perceive change. It also reminded us of how abundantly and generous sharing can be among the global community of teachers. K-12 schools face an almost impossible challenge in reconciling the complex and sometimes contradictory demands of students, parents, governments, and even universities. In COVID times, these challenges exploded for all of us. But the power of sharing among the teacher community with teaching resources, tools, strategies, content, roadmaps, training like this has enabled schools to handle all the challenges thrown our way. Never before has this kind of generosity and sharing of ideas and knowledge happened. As COVID recedes, its volatility, complexity and digitalization will not because that's a result of COVID. Yesterday, we heard from Monita on how we as school heads can support teacher agency to build expansive learning. And then teacher agency was on full display in the panel discussion right after when Sita, Dipanshu and Tanya shared so many stories of teachers adapting to online and hybrid learning. Unleashing our combined knowledge and unique strengths, we can together build a stronger support system to handle the new world. SIPSA is an uncompromisingly teacher-centric organization that selflessly builds a community of teachers. It is an honor and labor of love for us to work with them for this unique event every two years in partnership with exceptional faculty from around the world. This year, as we all share the what, why, and how of meaningful learning in the primary years, we have practitioners from across India, but also from Vietnam, Singapore, Japan, and Canada. With that, let me hand over to Somya to introduce our keynote speaker today, who's joining us very kindly and generously late in the night. The God of Inquiry, whose upcoming book maybe is another step we can take to strengthen this community with launching a Saipsa book club. Over to you, Somya. Thank you, Kavita. Good morning, everybody. I'm Somya. I'm the PYP coordinator at Neve Academy, and I welcome you all to the day two of the SIPSA PYP Job Alike 2021. Those of you who joined us yesterday, yesterday evening, I'm sure you could derive valuable learnings and insights from our sessions yesterday. We have an interesting day ahead with some really distinguished participants. Please follow the schedule for accessing these sessions. Just to let you know that we will have this webinar link up and running the whole day, we will keep returning to this common room for all our common sessions. We have two breakout sessions scheduled for today. During these breakout sessions, you will need to go to your individual Zoom links. Our first session of the day starts with Trevor McKenzie. We are very proud and glad to welcome Trevor, who's an expert inquiry practitioner, is an experienced teacher, author, keynote speaker, and inquiry consultant who has worked in schools in Australia, Asia, North America, South Africa, and Europe. Trevor is an inquiry guru that puts personalized learning and student agency at the forefront of his work. He has authored two books, Dive Into Inquiry and Inquiry Mindset. He brings close to 20 years of teaching experience with him as he shares what are the roots to his teaching practice, cultivating wonderment, being a responsive educator, and the power of student agency. Trevor has been making connections with many of us through his videos, recent videos that you may have watched and reaching out to take opinions with regards to his next book. Be prepared for a heartfelt and passionate keynote experience that is certain to leave you full of wonder, vision and excitement to adopt a different kind of learning as, you, as your own. In this session titled, A Different Kind of Learning, Stories from the Inquiry Classroom, Trevor McKenzie will share stories from his, from his personal inquiry classrooms, stories of student leadership, and ownership over learning, stories of doing schooling differently, 
and leveraging technology to truly change education and stories of relationship where kindness and humor break down walls, allowing students to meaningfully engage, achieve and have an impact. Over to you, Trevor. Uh, now, a very gentle reminder to all of you, those who are using our social media handles, please share your learnings and experiences with the handles mentioned on the slide. Thank you so much. Thank you, Salmaya. Uh, and thank you, everyone. Um, first, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional lands and territories of the Lekwungen people, of whose land I live and I work and I play. And I hold my hands up to you all and I say, Haichka. Uh, thank you for honoring me with your presence and your engagement. This evening here in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada, we are starting at just after 7 p.m. So it's not too late. I know it's your Saturday morning, perhaps uh, definitely on the other side of the globe. But wherever you are, I hope that you are happy and healthy and safe. Um, and it is an honor to be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right away just so we can transition. Um, there we go. Fantastic just so I can make sure everything's running smoothly and you'll be able to see my title slide now. Um, I really appreciate the fine introduction. Uh, I, I find myself blushing when people give an introduction my way. It's just, it's so kind and I'm, I'm very honored to be here, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, I, I suppose I, I wear two hats in education. I have two roles in education. Uh, one role that I have is, is I'm a teacher of students. Uh, I'm an English teacher, a high school teacher here at Oak Bay High School in the Greater Victoria School District. In fact, my school is just a five minute walk from my house. Uh, my two sons who are 11 and eight, their schools are a few minutes further. And so we, we are quite a, a tight community here in Oak Bay, uh, Victoria, British Columbia. Um, and, and, I, and I teach from an inquiry stance. Um, I suppose that means I hold certain values and certain beliefs that shape the time I spend with students. I, I'd like to share some of those values and beliefs with you today in this keynote. I'd like you to reflect on some of your values and beliefs as I share. Um, but another hat that I wear in education, another role I have is, is I'm a teacher of teachers. Uh, I'm fortunate to be able to support schools around the world in implementing inquiry-based learning pre-COVID that meant getting on a lot of planes and juggling uh, two different calendars uh, and schedules and passions of mine, teaching students, but also teaching teachers. And now, of course, all of this work is, is virtual. And so uh, here I am with you, not leaving the comfort or my slippers here in my home. So welcome to my home in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. I, I not only invite you into my home, I invite you into the communities of which I'm a part of. If you have a phone beside you, please take a photo of this slide uh, and join me at these social media spaces. There are over, oh, almost a thousand people that are a part of this webinar currently. It'd be amazing to see you all join those communities during this webinar. And it's not about followers, my friends. It is about a community of like-minded educators who have come together around the topic of inquiry-based learning. You know, on Twitter there, there are roughly 19,000 people, uh, maybe 8,000 people on Instagram. And those are all friends that I've worked with at schools around the world. Uh, and we support one another. We share resources. We support one another in our learning to impact the learning of our students. Uh, if there's ever a question you have, uh, a resource you're looking for, please simply tag me in a tweet and that's your message to me to retweet that question, that query to that community. Um, and within minutes, I am sure that people will respond. I see it time and time again. So I invite you to be a part of those communities there. I share resources, I share ideas for my classroom, questions I'm unpacking in my practice, questions that guide my practice. Um, and my website, of course, is full of free resources. A lot of the resources I'll share with you in this keynote are going to be found right there on my website, trevormckenzie.com. Uh, I have two publications, Dive Into Inquiries, my first publication. Um, that was really written for all educators in mind, K to higher ed. But Inquiry Mindset really has been written for elementary school educators, PYP educators, um, you know, and, and that has in turn kind of created a space for Dive and Inquiry to be more for the middle school and high school educators. So there is a book for every level of education. Uh, and my third publication, as we were 
discussing there briefly in the introduction is, is due to be out in May, and this is the first time I've been able to share the cover with a broader community. So it's really it brings me a lot of joy to share this with you. Inquiry Mindset Assessment Edition. This is uh, what we do in inquiry and, and weave in our assessment practice to be more student-centered, more student-driven, to provide our students not just an equitable entry point into learning, but also a deeper understanding, a sharper understanding, an accurate understanding of the assessment realm of their time in inquiry. Um, the, the, the person who's writing the foreword to the book is currently doing that now and their name will grace the cover as well. So the only thing that's going to change about this cover is the, uh, the forward contributor's name. Um, this book is going to be due out in May of this year. So just a few short months away, we are almost there. Uh, it's been quite a journey with this third publication. And uh, I invite you to be a part of that at my newsletter, which you can find at trevormckenzie.com. So without further ado, um, I do have a notebook here in front of me. And, and I tend to take notes as I go, as I'm learning. The more I speak and share and connect with teachers around the world, the more I learn. And, and I'm very interested in your interests. I'm very interested in learning from you. And I do propose that you have a notebook down in front of you. I am going to ask you some questions. I am going to ask you to get thinking. And I think it's really helpful for you to do some documentation of your wonderings and your learning and your experience during our time together. There is going to be a chance at the end for a Q&A. So if you have a burning question, um, please hold on to it or perhaps throw it in the chat. Um, and I look forward to fielding some of those. I don't know if we'll have an opportunity to cover everyone given that the group is so large, but we will definitely take some questions towards the end of our time together. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to share with you some of those resources now. Oh, that's a slow moving slide. There we go. And here's the next resource. Uh, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the sketch note. And, uh, you know, uh, you can find all of these sketch notes at my website, trevormckenzie.com. Um, and all of these sketch notes are used in the schools that I support, not just with teachers helping them to understand how to implement inquiry based learning but also with students to deepen their understanding of, of inquiry and the student experience of student agency. And also with parents, you know, many of our students' parents are, are perhaps unfamiliar with the inquiry method. And so these resources really do help all stakeholders of our school. Uh, they present an opportunity for clarity, an opportunity for discourse and conversation around what the teaching and learning is going to look like in our classrooms, an opportunity to guide next steps. And, and all of these sketch notes reflect uh, some of my beliefs in education, you know, and this one in specific kind of reflects how I believe in supporting young people to slowly take control over their learning. And, and in taking control over their learning, what are the skills? the competencies, the dispositions, the ATLs that we need to coach and model to help them be more successful in taking on this type of agency over learning. I believe in the power of curiosity and wonderment um, in the inquiry world, a well-utilized and sharpened tool in our repertoire is the provocation. And uh, I love the provocation to, to spark that wonder and curiosity within our students. And that, I do believe it's my responsibility, our responsibility, if you teach from an inquiry stance, our responsibility is to spark the curiosity and wonderment within our students and leverage these so that we engage young people in ways that are more personally meaningful and relevant to them. So again, a part of our responsibility is to cultivate the conditions for curiosity, to cultivate the conditions for curiosity. You know, I believe I, I, that we are, from an inquiry stance, we are coaches, uh, you know, we are, we are facilitators, we are guides on an inquiry journey, and it is our job to demystify the process for our students. When there is uncertainty in the pathway, when there is uncertainty in the learning direction, students will report out feelings of being anxious or overwhelmed or uncertain in their learning. And this type of sketch note really paints the picture, so to speak, of what the landscape of inquiry could look like. 
given the agility, given the personal relevance, given some of the uncertainty around where students could go with their curiosities and wonderings, there are definitely hallmark kind of benchmark uh, reflection moments or steps along an inquiry journey. Um, you know, if I'm honest, I think, uh, you know, boys and, and young men love this sketch note that they, they, you know, the male student loves to see learning as an adventure. And they love to, you know, kind of get themselves ready for the quest, so to speak. Um, and, and again, this is to help students understand the process of inquiry and, and understand where we're going to next in inquiry. You know, I, I also believe in the power of student goals, student passions, student interests, um, things that students want to challenge themselves in. And I do believe that it is my responsibility to help students set personalized learning goals. And we'll unpack that in my third publication, Inquiry Mindset Assessment Edition. How do we help students set personalized goals and have those guide some of their steps in the classroom? And the, and the four pillars of inquiry truly are a way, a way in which we can help students uh, co-design their goals and co-design their learning and co-design their next steps. I do believe that we cultivate the conditions for some really rich things to occur. You've heard me use that word a number of times, cultivate. And, and you know, to really cultivate and, and plant the seeds and, and nurture those seeds over time so that something beautiful will occur. These, these changes don't happen overnight, as we know. Uh, the, the beauty, the art, the science of our craft is that it, it's, it's slowly moving despite the hectic nature of our practice, of our, of our positions, of our career, uh, the things that matter most in learning uh, are quite slow moving. And, and if we enter the classroom through the lens of cultivating the conditions for this slow moving change to happen, and that, again, I love that quote, when a flower doesn't bloom, you fix the environment in which it grows and, and not the flower. And doesn't that really reflect the beauty of inquiry-based learning, just in that one quote alone? Uh, all, again, all of these sketch notes you can find at trevormckenzie.com. The, the last sketch note I'd like to show you here is, is the power of constructivism. I, I do believe in constructivism. Uh, I do believe that inquiry-based learning is a tree of many constructivist frameworks and, and, and pedagogies and structures whether it's passion-based learning or place-based learning or you know, the Montessori method, problem-based learning, community-based learning, all of these are rooted in certain beliefs and those beliefs are reflected in constructivism. And I'd like to start now by unpacking what some of these beliefs around constructivism are. Uh, and this is where the notebook is really gonna be quite helpful for you. As I share some of these beliefs, I, I'm curious if you could record your reflections around uh, alignment with these beliefs. Um, do these beliefs exist in your practice? And, and if so, what, what do they look like and what do they sound like and what do they feel like? How do they surface in your teaching practice? In teaching from an inquiry stance, how do these beliefs bubble up in your day-to-day -day interactions with your students? So having a notebook in front of you, friends, will help you in some of your reflection now excuse me. Um, and I'm going to share a few beliefs. I'm going to, I'm going to talk through them a little here. Um, before we get into some storytelling, I do have one particular story I'd like to share from my career that has really left a, a mark on me. You know, one belief of the constructivist educator is that the learner is active and that the learner is an active contributor and, and in part creating the learning, co-designing the learning. You know, th this is a big shift for the traditional teacher, if you will. Uh, the, moving beyond merely being uh, 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 having the student being a passive participant in learning and having them be an active partner in learning, that's, that's a massive shift in how we see our interactions and our relationships working in the classroom. An underpinning of the inquiry model is co-designing and co-constructing with students. And that's a big question I have for you. How do you have conversations with students where through the questions you ask, you are facilitating the conditions for you all to co-design a process, 
to co-design next steps, to co-design certain beliefs or certain parameters around how the learning experience will look and feel and sound. That co-design underpinning really is reflected in, in this first belief uh, that the learner is, is active and, and they're a creator. They're, they're, they're a participant in the learning to the extent of which they are co-designing the learning. How, what does this belief look like in your practice? How does it bubble up? What does co-designing look like in, in your classroom? If we weren't you know, here virtually connecting across landscapes and, and vast time zone divides, if I was able to come visit you in your classroom and observe you teach, how would I see this belief bubble up? What would, what would, what would it look like? What would I notice? What would I observe? Please write down a few things. The next belief of the constructivist educator is that we believe in agency, we believe in control, student control over learning, and we believe in student ownership. And, and agency for me, when I talk about student agency, it, I, I'm talking about doing the heavy lifting of learning and helping our students sharpen the skills, the competencies, the dispositions, the habits of mind, so that they can take that agency over their learning. You know, one guiding question I ask myself dozens of times a day, and maybe this is a question you'll want to write down. I, and this question, as I ask it to myself, not to my students, to myself, shapes how I interact with my students. And the guiding question is this, Am I doing something for my students that they should be doing for themselves? Again, am I doing something for my students that they should be doing something for themselves? And if the answer is yes, my friends, quite honestly, I refuse to do it. I, I refuse to be the teacher at the front of the room, uh, robbing my students of certain responsibilities over learning, certain heavy lifting elements of the learning. If, if my students can't do it yet, that they should be doing that, but they can't do it yet, that's where I coach and I model so that they can take on that agency over their learning. That guiding question is rich. And when I say I ask myself that question a dozen times a day, it sometimes it's the most minute micro experience of agency that I'm considering. And sometimes it, it's, it's larger. Sometimes it's more of the deep end of the inquiry pool. Sometimes it's something that I've scaffolded towards to get to across vast amounts of time of coaching and modeling and nurturing the conditions for them to be successful with the depth of that agency. Agency just isn't one or the other. It's not just the small minute experiences where we're giving ownership and voice over to our students. And it's not just the depths of the inquiry pool, free inquiry, if you will. It's both. And both woven together will create a, an agency rich experience for our students where they begin to feel the benefit of that control and that ownership over their learning. I'm curious if you could write something down about what agency looks like in your practice. Uh, again, if I would observe you teach for a day, let's say we had the time to be together for a day and you allowed me to come into your room and observe you teach and uh, give you some thoughts of what I noticed and what I observed and any wonderings I may have had, what would the agency in your room look like? Maybe there are some micro examples and maybe there are some macro examples. Another belief of the constructivist educator is that we believe in calm and confidence and a strong sense of self. And, and I'm not referring to, I want these things for myself. As a teacher, of course, I wanna have a calm day. I wanna have a confident day, but I, I want these feelings to emerge in the student experience. I, I want my students to find a sense of calm in their learning. There's some great science around the power of calm and learning. And, and you know how in schools, we're not built around calm, are we? Uh, you know, for the most part, we're built around some pretty hectic movements and transitions and noises and, and, and uh, behaviors. And I really propose that we try to find more space in our schools, in our learning, in our lesson design for calm to occur. You know, one question I ask my students at the end of every week. So I asked my students this question before they left today 
Friday morning. Uh, it was the last block of the day with this one particular group. And I asked them one guiding question that they had to let me know their feelings, their thoughts to this question before they left the classroom today. And, and the question was simple, but powerful. The question was, tell me how you're feeling about your learning. Looking back at this week, how are you feeling about your role as a learner and your learning? And as you leave the room, just walk by and, and let me know and I'll, I'll jot down some, some of what you share. You know, what my students told me today, it filled my inquiry heart. I'll share with you some of the things students told me today. Some students said that they feel calm, they feel at ease, they feel confident, they feel in control. One student said he felt like he's entertained, which I loved. You know, th th because he's the entertainer, not me. He's the, he's the class clown. He's the funny man. You know, I, I really appreciate hearing those things from my students, not just because it segues so beautifully into this point in this keynote, but most importantly, because those feelings that they shared with me today reflect the conditions I am trying to cultivate in my classroom from my very first interactions with these students. I would say every behavior or move I have, I make on the campus of my school is cultivating the conditions, whether they're my students or not. I am always trying to create the conditions for students to find calm and confidence and a sense of stronger sense of self in their time in our in our schools. Um, and so you know, what they shared with me today reflects a lot of what I'm trying to cultivate long term. Uh, with the students I'm serving, but also just my role in my school. One thing I do every morning, I'm quite proud to say this, and I don't share this anywhere on social media, but I'll share it with you now. One thing I do every morning at my school, I've only missed a, a small amount of mornings this year, is I'm at the front door of our school greeting kids in. I'm not the principal. I'm not the head of the school. I, I'm, I'm just a teacher but I'm one of those who holds the door open for our kids each and every morning. I, I greet them with a smile. I say, good morning. I say, happy Friday. I say, have a good day. It's good to see you. I would say maybe 10 of my students walk by me through that door each morning and head up to our class. And maybe two or 300 other students walk by me. And I know some of them, sometimes, some, some of them I don't know. Uh, you, I'm really cultivating the conditions for some amazing things to happen uh, for when they do walk into my classroom, but also just for them to have a fantastic day, to be seen in the morning, to be recognized with a sense of calm and a sense of confidence and a stronger sense of self. Someone sees me. Someone's in my corner. Someone cares about me. So again, how are you creating the conditions, cultivating the conditions for more calm to happen in your classrooms? Uh, how are you creating the conditions for your students to discover confidence over their learning? And how are you using reflection perhaps to have students gain a stronger sense of self? As you can see, these beliefs are, are framed in some really big questions, aren't they? And as you reflect, as you document, I think what we're doing is we're, we're slowly unpacking our practice, aren't we? On your page with these beliefs, you're slowly unpacking and teasing out the richness of how these beliefs surface in your teaching practice. The next belief, excuse me. As I mentioned with provocations, I believe in the power of questions, the power of wonder, the power of curiosity. Um, you know, recently I tweeted and, and threw something on Instagram out that, you know, our curriculum isn't something that we cover. Our curriculum is something that we explore and we discover together. We, we invite our students into the curriculum through provocation to spark their curiosity and their wonder. I think a misconception around inquiry-based learning is that inquiry and the curriculum are two different entities. They're two different things. And, and that's just not the case. Maybe we can see it as being inquiry is the plate and we, we serve the, cur the curriculum on the plate of inquiry. I, I kind of like that analogy. That's a beautiful one. And, and we invite our students to ask questions, to explore the curriculum, to uncover the curriculum. And it begins with provocation. It begins with sparking their curiosity and their wonderment. I spend a lot of time supporting teachers in curating, designing, researching, 
rich provocations. And provocations could be, could be videos, they could be images, they could be field trips in the pre-COVID era, you know, taking your students to a place to spark wonder. Um, provocations could be artifacts. You know, here in, in my school, I have a closet full of some really neat, weird, strange things that I, I love to pull out occasionally. And through thinking routines, I, I, I am a big fan of Ron Richard's work. This is his most recent publication, The Power of Making Thinking Visible. Uh, through some really specific thinking routines combined with provocations, I begin to harness and leverage the students' wonders and curiosities that will shape what our unit design inevitably will look like. So although I have a vision of what we're going to unpack in a, in a unit, a lot of what begins to create the details of that unit stem from the students' questions and their wonderings and their curiosities. So again, what does this look like in your practice? Where, 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 does, where does this belief bubble up? If I were to watch you teach again, how would this show in, in your practice? You know, another belief of the constructivist educator is that uh, we believe in the power of talk, we believe in the power of thinking, and we believe in the power of reflecting. And I know a lot of you are probably nodding your heads like, of course we do, Trevor, of course. You know, I, I think talk is probably the most underutilized assessment tool in a teacher's practice, in a teacher's repertoire. You know, what, what are the roots to literacy? The roots to literacy, the roots to strong readers and writers is, is talk. And the more we can get our students talking, telling stories, communicating openly and freely in class, all the way up through the grades, all the way up through high school, the more we can leverage talk, the more not only will we see literacy improve, but we'll also create equitable entry points into learning if we leverage the power of talk. You know, I can't tell you enough how many times I've, I've sadly seen high school students come to my classroom and, uh, you know, I would say Trevor McKenzie version 1.0, you know, long ago, I used to rely on the students' hands that would go up. I'd ask a question and maybe I'd see three hands go up. And, and what I realized, it was the same three hands would go up whenever I was utilizing this discussion technique or this assessment tech technique. Whenever I asked for student volunteers or hands, I would see the same three or four students' hands go up. And, and I, I say it's sad because essentially that's, you know, a large part of the demographic or the, the, the I should say, the, um, the student body, the, the student numbers are actually tuning out, they're checking out. If I'm only seeing three or four hands willing to engage and I'm not seeing 20, 25 hands going up, I, I need to change my assessment framework. I need to change my, and find a more equitable framework. So how can we leverage chalk so it's not the same three or four kids putting their hands up all the time? So we get to harness talk in small groups and, and have students safely and freely share their opinion. I'll, I'll give you one trick, and this will be a fun one if you want to write this one down. I, I call it rehearsal time, and I write about this in my next book. I love rehearsal time. So a lot of my classrooms are configured in, in small pods. Students turn and they face each other in small pods. Uh, groups of three perhaps is a nice number. Um, and, and so in, in small pods, rather than asking students to put their hand up and engage in a discussion or a conversation in that manner, I, I frame a question and I ask the little pods of three and I ask all students to choose one volunteer that will speak on behalf of your group. So when it comes time of the seven pods I have in the room, I'm gonna have seven volunteers speak on behalf of each group. And in the next three or four minutes, your pod is gonna help that volunteer rehearse what it is they're gonna share out. So kind of a curation of all your thinking, all your ideas are gonna be taken to the table and that volunteer is gonna rehearse, you're gonna help them rehearse what it is that they're gonna share out. And then I, I hear from those seven volunteers. After three or four minutes of rehearsal time, I hear from those seven volunteers. As they're rehearsing, I walk through the room and I listen. So I'm not listening to the person who's volunteering. I, I listen to the, to the students who are helping them rehearse. Are they understanding? Are they engaged in the thinking? Are they aligned with the direction I hope we're going? And I end up getting some really rich information of, about who needs my support 
and who doesn't need my support when I walk through the room and I listen during rehearsal time. You know, I have to say, I honestly, rehearsal time has been such a shift in what the classroom looks like and sounds like and feels like. For the first three or four months of class, so this is, again, cultivating the conditions, isn't it? I hear from the same seven volunteers. So every time we do rehearsal time, I see the same volunteers each time end up being the volunteer. After about three or four months, there's a shift. I start to hear from different people at each group. Different people start to volunteer. And do you know why they're starting to volunteer? They're starting to volunteer for a couple reasons. One reason is because they know Mr. McKenzie will never call on them blindly without giving them time to rehearse and collect their thoughts and process at a pace that works for them. And then they also know that they have the benefit of working with their friends to really sharpen their thinking so they're not going to be judged or ridiculed by anybody in the class for not having articulated themselves as well as they would have liked. It's an equitable framework. And it's an opportunity for me to walk through the room, listen to students, and take notes as I'm listening as to who needs more of my support and who doesn't. And slowly we create the conditions for all students to share their voice. So again, you know, how can we leverage talk to get to the thinking and really embed reflection throughout our time with students? How would this belief surface in your classroom? If I were to visit you, how, how would I see and hear the talk and the thinking and the reflection? Excuse me, let's go on to another belief. Uh, as I mentioned earlier around competencies and dispositions and habits of mind and ATLs, I, I, I'm a huge believer in these being inquiry skills and not just inquiry skills. These are the skills that will transcend context. These are the skills that students will flex. They'll, they'll flex these skills like muscles throughout their time with us. And slowly they'll acquire a, a, a toolkit of skills that they could apply to any situation, whether it's math or history or writing or life, whether it's a hobby or sport or employment or relationships. These are the, 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 the secret sauce of inquiry-based learning. Truly, how are we coaching and modeling the skills students will need to take on more agency over learning? You know, in the IB, we have such a rich opportunity with the ATLs. And um, I, I just don't want to see ATLs as being a monthly skill that we all focus on. You know, it's on the calendar. And we talk about being a risk taker this month. You know, that, that's truly not good enough. That's a good start. But how do we tease out being a risk taker? You know, each of these competencies is quite sophisticated. But there are layers to each of these competencies, each of these ATLs. Risk taking, for example, looks quite differently from a six year old compared to a 16 year old. And, and how do we tease out risk taking so that a 16 year old can reflect on themselves as a learner and talk about and gather evidence of this skill being flexed across learning? That's a really rich conversation to have with students. I ask my students to tell me, what does risk taking look like and sound like and feel like? You know, how do we know it's actually happening? Let me know what it looks like and sounds like and feels like. So when I see it, I'll, I'll pause, I'll time out the class and I'll lift up the examples of what we're supposed to be seeing. And this is a great opportunity for us to co-design what these ATLs, these competencies look like. You know, uh, curiosity is a rich one, isn't it? I love curiosity. Curiosity sounds like questioning. If we want our students to be curious and flex this competency, we need to harness the power of questions in our practice. And how do we frame questions uh, around our unit design? How do we harness questions, spark questions? Here's another fantastic book. I, I just adore Dan Rothstein and Lou Santana's work. It's called Make Just One Change. Make Just One Change. And they outline uh, a strategy called the question formulation technique. And the question formulation technique, QFT, is a questioning protocol 
that we can utilize to help our students become more competent questioners. You know, the QFT is a really planned, structured way for me to ignite questions, use questions, leverage questions in order to demonstrate the competency of curiosity. I, I did that teacher timeout just a few moments ago. That's something I love doing in the classroom. When I see a competency at work, when I see an ATL being flexed, I pause it. I say, kids, today we're flexing the critical thinking competency. Do you feel it? How, how do we know it's happening? How do you know? That's your, your reflection question right now. I want you to turn to a friend and talk about how you are a critical thinker right now. So it's not just about the content. The content is important, but the competencies being the vehicle for the content, that's where we need to take our inquiry practice to. Marry the content with the competencies. What do these competencies look like in your practice, I, I mentioned we, we don't just want to see the ATLs on your calendar being, you know, this is the ATL of the month. I say that kind of jokingly, but sincerely, we need to really embody these competencies. We need to coach them and model them and talk about them and connect them to the richness of the curriculum. So students can flex them over time and utilize them in any context. You know, the last belief of the constructivist educator is the power of relationships. And I know this is an overarching truth in education, but some really amazing things occur when we build strong relationship with our students. You know, probably, you know, it, from an inquiry stance, we get to know our students better as people, what their interests are, what their curiosities are, what their hobbies are. Um, you know, if they're, if they're athletes, if they're artists, what's happening at home, what's happening in their lives. All of this rich information provides us opportunity to plan learning. Absolutely, undeniably. You know, another reason we build strong relationship is so we can get to know our students better as learners and they can get to know themselves better as learners. I love to ask my students, what are your learning strengths and what are your learning stretches? What are the things you're really, really good at in learning? And what are some things that are stretches for? I love that phrase. It's not beautiful stretches. Like, you know, I, I'm not there yet, that growth mindset. I, I may not possess it and embody it yet. And, and, and I ask my students these questions, partly so I can gather that rich information. What, what do they perceive to be their strengths? And what do they perceive to be their stretches? And I want to start learning from a strength-based perspective, don't I? From, from that standpoint where everyone can feel confident and everyone can be successful. Don't we want that for all of our students? You know, I also ask this, this question, so not, not just do I get a chance to get to know our students better, they get to reflect on themselves as learners deeply and, and think about what, what am I really good at? What are my skills? And what are some things that are stretches for me, that are challenges for me? And then maybe I ask them this question several times across the span of time, where as I'm cultivating the conditions for these competencies to be flexed, maybe something that was a stretch early in the year slowly becomes not so much of a stretch for a student. And, and asking those questions throughout the year, how are you feeling about yourself as a learner? How are your strengths and your stretches this week or this month allows us to track the slow moving things that we are trying to cultivate in our classrooms. Another rich piece of relationships that I'd like to highlight is, is that it creates psychological safety for our students. If they trust us, if they feel at home with us, they're able to take some risks with us. And I, I absolutely love that because when it comes time for our students to get to the deeper end of the inquiry pool, to take on more of that agency over learning, they're, they're going to have to demonstrate some vulnerability and they're going to have to rely on that trust that we were cultivating throughout our time together. You know, I, I, this, this quote breaks my heart and I, I'll just give you a sec to read that. And I'm curious if you've had students who have either said something similar to you or maybe their behavior reflects that this is what they think about school. 
And, you know, I, I had one particular student that I taught and I write about him in Dive and Inquiry. And I, I'm not able to speak about him too often. So to have the chance to speak about Garrison right now with you as an Inquiry story, it's incredibly meaningful to me. And I know time is a little bit limited. I'm not going to breeze through the Garrison story, but um, Garrison means a lot to me. And I, I want to do this story justice before we get to the Q&A. You know, Garrison was a student who had been relatively disconnected from school. He didn't believe in the worth of school. Uh, Garrison's older brother, sadly, had been expelled from our school for some really uh, inappropriate behavior. And, and Garrison kind of wore his brother's expulsion uh, on his shoulders, like it was a weight that he was destined to wear throughout his time in our school. And perhaps it was a reality that awaited him. Perhaps one day he wouldn't be successful in school either. You know, back when I taught Garrison, um, I was a part of a really dynamic team of teachers who were working with our most vulnerable students at this particular school. And our principal was very courageous. He gave us some freedoms and some liberties and some support to do things for these most vulnerable students that kind of blew my mind, really stretched my thinking and my beliefs around what we do in schools. And Garrison was one of those students where I taught him in grade nine and he was on my caseload and I worked tirelessly to have him be successful in school and he failed my class. And then in grade 10, he came back for more and the same experience occurred. I worked tirelessly and he failed my class again. And by this point, I went to the principal's office and I said, it's not working with Garrison. You know, he ends up disappearing from class for days and weeks on end. And when I phone his mom and his dad, they're not picking up the phone. I, I can't find Garrison. And the principal would say, go to their house, Trevor. Have you stopped by their house? Go knock on their door and see if you can talk to them face to face. And I just, I, it just blew my mind that that type of compassion and understanding from a principal uh, would be given as a liberty for me to pursue. And so I, I started to do that. I started to go to Garrison's house before school. On my way driving to school, I'd go to his house and I'd knock on his door. And uh, his mom would open up the door and she'd yell at Garrison, Garrison, T-Mac, that's, that's what the kids call me, T-Mac is here. And he would lumber downstairs, big six foot four Garrison, and he would get in my car and I'd drive him to school. And sometimes by our afternoon class, he wouldn't even make it to my class. He, I'd see him in the halls, six foot four, kind of standing tallly above, above all the kids. And I'd say, Garrison, and he'd say, T-Mac, and then he'd duck and he'd disappear. You know, Garrison, um, he loved the social side of school, but he hated the learning side of school. He loved the friends and the connections, and he hated the accountability. And by the time Garrison got into grade 12, he had failed my class in grade nine, grade 10, and grade 11. And I went to the counselor and I said, what is going on with Garrison? Like, it's not working. And she said, Trevor, you're the only one who has a relationship with him. You're the only class he's even remotely attending. And I, I just, it really confirmed my beliefs around relationship and really started to redefine my ideas of what success looks like and really challenge my ideas of, of you know, how I perceive success across all students or I should be looking at success as an individual endeavor. You know, in grade 12, Garrison pulled the same old thing with me where he was attending beautifully for the first few weeks of class. And then as soon as that first assignment was due, he disappeared. And it was this four way stop one day at lunch where I was driving to get a cup of coffee where I saw Garrison on his skateboard. And I rolled down my window and I said, Garrison. And he said, T-Mac. <laughs> and I said, I'm going for coffee. Come with me. And again, my courageous principal would support this. He would say, do anything you can to support kids like Garrison. I'm not suggesting you take kids in your car for coffee. That's not what I'm suggesting. But for kids like Garrison, my, my principal gave us a lot of liberty to support them. And I took Garrison out for coffee that day. And I'll never forget it. I asked him one question. And the question I asked him was, Garrison, what do you truly love to do? What do you love to do? And to my surprise, he said, graffiti art. And I said, really? And he said, yeah, let me show you. And I thought he was gonna take out his phone and show me his graffiti on his phone. But instead we got back into my car and we drove a few blocks away and we hiked over these abandoned uh, railroad tracks to this warehouse where he showed me some of his work. 
And I was blown away. I was blown away because he had been doing this behind my back for four years and I had no idea. I was blown away because I'm not an artist, but he's good at what he does. You know, you could tell the untrained eye can tell he's good. There's talent there. And then I was blown away because, you know, I could see symbolism there. I could see theme there. I could see conflict there. All these standards I was trying to assess in English, Garrison knew. He was showing me them. So I said to Garrison, as I was taking all these photos of his graffiti art, and he was looking at me like I was crazy. I said, Garrison, could you do something for me on graffiti art? And he said, sure, what do you want? And with kids like Garrison, we say anything, just give me something, this is cool, like anything. And he said, when do you want it by? I said, why don't you come back to class tomorrow and give me something, a piece of writing? And he said, sure, I'll, I'll be there. And the next day he walked into my class and directly to my desk emphatically turned in some writing. And it was so emphatic that I dropped everything in that moment and I read this piece of work and it was really good. It was a fantastic piece of writing, the best piece of writing I'd seen from Garrison ever. And it, it, it was a, a narrative essay, a personal narrative essay describing our day together, the day before and how meaningful it was for him that an adult in his life asked him what he's passionate about and that he was able to show me something he loved to do. And he was so honored that I took interest in his interests. It, the, the essay almost brought me to tears and I, I paused everything. I called Garrison back to the, my desk and I said, Garrison, we're onto something here, aren't we? Like, can you do more about graffiti art? And he said, yeah, what do you want me to do? And I said, I've got all these photos on my phone. Could you do something with them? And he said, sure, give me your phone. I thought he was going to airdrop the photos to his phone. And instead, he walked right up to the class, the front of the room, and he started to swipe through the photos and talk to the, glass, the class about our experience the day before. And essentially, he was doing the essay, but in presentation format. And kids would put up their hand. They would ask him questions like, um, you know, why did you choose those colors? And he would talk about conflict. Or what does that word mean? And he, he spoke about symbolism. And so I took out my grade book and I'm writing all these notes down like check, standard, check, standard. He, he knew the standards, but they were being demonstrated in something that was highly relevant to Garrison. You know, for the rest of the year, all Garrison did, did was graffiti art. You know, over here, we were doing Hamlet as a group. And over here, he was researching his most inspiring graffiti artists. Over here, we were writing a persuasive essay on global warming as a class. And over here, Garrison was writing a persuasive letter to our local government, trying to convince them to legalize graffiti art in some of our public spaces. You know, Garrison's work in my class, his role in my class, it took a complete 180. And all of a sudden he was attending, he was engaged, he was successful. And of course, like any proud teacher does, I started to brag about Garrison to anyone that would listen. And I was bragging about Garrison in the staff room one day at lunch. And a couple teachers overheard me bragging about Garrison. And essentially what I was talking about was really seeing Garrison, like truly seeing Garrison, really seeing what he's passionate about and what he's interested in. And these other two teachers took an interest in what I was speaking about. This is Garrison way back when. That's him doing graffiti art on the right, and that's him painting a skateboard on the left. One of the teachers that showed an interest was his math teacher. This is him here. And uh, a big, massive, six foot seven football coach of a man. And he came over to me after he overheard me talking about Garrison, and he said to me, uh, hey, T-Mac, tell me more about Garrison. And so I, I kind of was thinking in my head, how is he going to do graffiti art in math? I'd like to see this. And so I shared with him everything I I'd been doing with Garrison. And then I asked him, you know, in, in a couple of weeks, can I come up and see if anything's changed in, in math class now that you know this? And the coach said, yeah, sure, come on up. So I gave it two weeks and I went up and I knocked on his door and, and I came in and sat with the coach alone without the kids in the room. And I said, so how's Garrison doing in your class now? And he said, beautiful, complete 180, just like you've seen in your class. He's attending, he's doing well, he's engaged. And I said, so how are you weaving graffiti art in math? How are you doing that? And he said, I'm not teaching graffiti art in math. Are you crazy? He said, all I did was ask him the same question that you asked him. What are you passionate about? 
and I showed interest in his interests. And he started to engage with me in math. He started to show up more once he, once he saw that I cared about his interests. And I thought, is it that easy? Is it really that easy that all we have to do with some students is show interests in their interests? You know, his art teacher was the other teacher that was in the staff room overhearing me brag about Garrison that day. And, and to, of all the, the spaces in the school that would honor Garrison's passion, I thought it would be the art space. And she had never asked him a question like, what's your favorite type of art? Our graffiti artist had taken three years of art and not shown our art teacher his love for graffiti. I was blown away. She gave him an opportunity to build, to create a, a school mural, a, a graduation present for his graduates, uh, his graduating peers. And this is what that mural looks like. It's beautiful. We, we were a Squimalt High School. And I would catch Garrison late at night as I was leaving the building to go home. I would walk down the hall to see his progress that day. And I would catch him working on it at five o'clock at night. And I'd say, Garrison, do you want me to drive you home? And he'd say, no, 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 no. I, I got to finish this for graduation. I got to finish this for graduation. You know, Garrison's story really represents for me a massive shift in how I view students' interests getting to know our students, building relationship with them. How could we harness those interests and those passions and connect them to standards and have them model their interests and their skills to achieve the standards? You know, this is a fantastic piece of art in our community that Garrison was commissioned to paint. It's a massive music fest that happens annually here. The government agency that hired Garrison to paint this mural was the same government agency he was writing letters to in grade 12, lobbying for them to legalize graffiti art in some of our public spaces. Isn't that something? How do we make learning more relevant for our students? How do we make learning more authentic for our students? It's through these beliefs of constructivism. It's through embodying these beliefs. It's through acting on these beliefs. And it's through weaving these beliefs in our unit design and our lesson design. I'm going to finish off the keynote here and we're going to transition to the q and I, I know I went overboard a little bit on the time, but in closing, I, I just want to thank you so much for engaging with me in this conversation and the Q&A uh, as we transition to the Q&A. And specifically, whatever you wrote on your page, I encourage you to continue to unpack it as you reflect further after our keynote time today. Salma, I'm so sorry I went further than we had anticipated. No, Preva, truly speaking, I really didn't want you to stop. It was really, really so very inspiring. Absolutely wonderful, Trevor. Absolutely. Thank I'm you. sure we all are blown away. That was truly an inspiring talk, especially about Garrison. What an amazing example of supporting the differentiation. Beautiful graffitis. Couldn't take you know, I'm sure none of us could take our eyes off. A truly straight from the heart talk, very touching, also sharing the different stories from your journey. That tells, tells us about the conviction and the belief that we need to have and prepare ourselves, you know, within the given framework that we apply to ensure our children will enjoy inquiry and nurture their curiosities. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing those lovely strategies and guiding us, you know, through all your great practices. Thank you so much. Do we have time for Q&A? Um, I think, uh, yes, we will be able to take a couple of questions in, although many have come, but I'll try to do as much justice as I can. That'd be um, fantastic. I think Q&As are always fun. And uh, if we have time, if we can honor the, some of the questions with some time, uh, that would be a lot of fun. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. So the first up question is from uh, Bhavna Narula, and she would like to know, how do we maintain calmness when there is a time limit for teachers, especially in the era of online learning? That's a great question. Um, you know, one way in which I value calmness is, and it sounds so silly and trite, but I tell my students I value calmness and I value calmness for me and I value their calmness. I also share with them all the values I shared with you in this keynote, all the constructivist values. I introduce myself to them as being a believer of those values. 
And I ask them to please hold me accountable to those values. As I ask you how you're feeling, if you're feeling not so calm, will you let me know? Um, so, so that's one piece is that we have to share our values, what we value with our students, we need to share those with them. Absolutely, I think our jobs are very hectic. Virtual learning, face-to-face -face learning, teaching is a dynamic profession. And I feel that having a lens on calm, uh, an awareness on calm, inevitably helps me create little small occurrences of calmness in our day. And I do want us to rely on the smallest of occurrences, realizing that the smallest things, the smallest moves or words or behaviors can have a lasting effect. And so I encourage you to find those small occurrences of calm in your day with students. If it's a quiet couple minutes of reflection, uh, a quiet couple minutes of writing, um, even the smallest circumstances of, of calm could have a, a lasting impact. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Uh, next up from Kavita, how can we start an inquiry in additional language? What makes it more interesting? Inquiry in additional language that can make it more interesting. Yeah, you know, we have to keep it real. And Kath Murdoch, my good friend out of Australia, says this so beautifully. We, we need to keep it real. And what she means by that is we need to keep it authentic and contextual. We need to keep it connected to the people and the place and the community. So whatever that new language is, what is the, what is the, um, the critical language that students are going to use in their day-to-day -day realities, their day-to-day -day existences? You know, I love working with schools, language classrooms where pre-COVID we're able to get the kids outside of the school using the language in some of the businesses or community spaces where the language is, is real, it's contextual, it's authentic. So that, that's the, the key piece to language and inquiries, keeping it real, keeping authentic and keeping it contextual. Absolutely, thank you for that. Um, how about uh, knowing, um, so Garrison was much older, you know, when you got to know about his strengths, right? How do we do this for our very young learners? Yeah, that's a years? lovely, that's a lovely question. You know, a lot of the students I teach at high school, I have the benefit of interviewing their parents. And, and I love interviewing their parents because um, I see these beautiful things emerge eventually as we cultivate the conditions for agency. And I love to hear from parents. And one question I ask parents is, tell me what your son or daughter was like when they were five or six or seven years old. And it never fails to amaze me that who they describe as a little person is the person I've worked with in my classrooms. You know, I, I have countless interviews with parents where they describe a, a, a young boy who was really playful with his hands and he needed to move and create and take things apart and put them back together again. And guess what he's doing as a senior? He's in our mechanics shop. He's in our wood shop building things. You know, who we see as, uh, you know, young students in years one, years two, et cetera, those are the seeds to who our students will be come 15, 16, 17 year olds. You know, play is learning. I, I can't overemphasize that enough. Creating the conditions so our students can get playful and create and talk and tell stories and, and create worlds based on imagination through play so we can begin to see what their strengths are and what their stretches are time and time again when i interview parents they tell me stories that really show, show the breadcrumb trail across a student's schooling experience at the younger years you all are creating the conditions for students to settle into themselves see themselves through a calm and confident light so that schooling is more rich and more meaningful for, for them. And, and I, I just, I implore you to, to keep doing that good work, that tirelessly hard work, Absolutely. because I get to reap the benefits of that hard work. As you cultivate those identities, those safe identities now, I get yeah. to leverage those later on in my practice. So thank you. I really see the passionate teacher that you are. You know, and most of your stories where you're making those anecdotal records, you're making those keen observations. I guess that allows you to really know about the child. You're completely in tune with the child's interests. And I think that makes it all work, right? Thank you. Yeah, Sam, I appreciate you saying that because I think that's a, a, a skill of the inquiry teacher is to notice, to be an observer, to, to really watch. You know, in my classroom, I have a magnifying glass that I hold up often. And it's kind of a silly prop, but it is a prop for being inquisitive, 
for, for noticing and picking up on the smallest of details. And I encourage inquiry practitioners to become noticers themselves of their practice and of their students. And it's also a skill that we want our students to sharpen, to become noticers and observers themselves. Thank you Absolutely. for that, Tom. I appreciate you recognizing that. Absolutely. We are learning, right? We are. <laughs> All right. Uh, Trevor, if you don't mind, last two questions, please. Yes. Thank you. So there's a question from Shalini and she's asking, smaller pods are a great way to get these students talking. Do we build on that and get them to talk when put back into a larger classroom setting? Uh, all right, so was that question about pods in a virtual setting and scaffolding yes. towards the, yeah, I, I absolutely, you know, um, breakout rooms are fantastic and, and breakout rooms have also proven quite challenging for some teachers that I've worked with virtually because some students refuse to talk. Um, some students refuse to turn on their video cameras. Some students don't have equitable access to Wi-Fi or technology. Breakout rooms are proving somewhat problematic. Uh, strengths of breakout rooms that I've witnessed are one, thinking routines really help. Ron Richard and Mark Church's work, allowing our students to really create, talk around a thinking routine, that structure, helps them dive into the breakout room really confidently, really orderly, and, and really timely. So thinking routines help in the, in the small breakout rooms. And then another one that I really have enjoyed using and, and helping teachers use is assigning roles to different students. So one person could be the breakout room leader, one could be the recorder, one could be the questioner. You know, those roles all give them a, a specific engagement entry point. And when you combine that with thinking routines, breakout rooms tend to be a lot more effectively utilized rather than just being a blank space that teachers are worried, I've got to go check up on all the breakout rooms to see if they're on task. You know, we can't be in all places at all times, but if we give them the framework of thinking routines and roles, they're more likely to be engaged in that space. The thinking routines will transcend the modality. And what I mean by that is if we use them now in virtual, they'll be able to transfer to the brick and mortar or vice versa really beautifully. So the hard work that you're doing cultivating the conditions for thinking routines to flourish will help you in the brick and mortar, as will the breakout room, the potting. So the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Thanks, Trevor. Uh, let's take uh, a last one. That's from Bhavna. With massive number of students in one class, how can one apply the same strategy you applied with Garrison to turn him into an engaged learner? That's a great question. Um, you know, in, in my practice, when I taught Garrison, he was in a class, he was in a large class. For me in North America, it's large. It was almost 35 kids, 40 kids. It was a, a significantly large class and I'm accustomed to. And, and at that point in the junction in our year, you know, to be honest, I was pretty desperate with Garrison. I, I, was, I was really grasping at anything. And I threw him in the deep end of the inquiry pool, so to speak. He went to free inquiry. I, we don't do that with kids. You know, I learned from Garrison that once I returned the next year, I wanted all students to experience what Garrison experienced. And I pushed them all into the deep end too fast and too soon. And a lot of them told me they were overwhelmed. Some of them did okay. A lot of them didn't do as well. And it was because I hadn't scaffolded across time. It, it was because I hadn't cultivated those competencies to become sharper and stronger across time. So a part of that question really begs us to unpack the notion of scaffolding to get our kids ready for that type of agency. So that despite the large numbers of a class, they have certain competencies that they can rely on with that agency over learning. Another piece is that the more voice and choice students have over their learning, the more structures we have to have in place to help them be successful. Um, you know, whether they're organizational structures, accountability or productivity structures, it's just not a free for all. It, you know, my co-author Rebecca likes to say a hot mess express. I, I love that saying. It, it's not supposed to be messy and, and um, without borders or parameters, especially when you have so many students of differing curiosities. In all of my publications, I share a lot of these frameworks that as students take on more agency over learning, students utilize these frameworks to be successful with that time and space. So we're, we're not overwhelmed by having so many students do such different 
unique, amazing things, and they're not overwhelmed with that agency over learning. So that, that's a very great question to kind of wrap our time up with, I think. Absolutely, Trevor. So just the last one, will you be able to share or is there a PDF version of your books available? Uh, there's awesome. not a PDF version of either of my publications. They're, they're available on Amazon and then they are available as audiobooks. So if you are an audiobook fan, um, that may be the most accessible for you if you can't get them from Amazon. Thank you so much, Trevor. It was a, an amazing session, very, very enriching. And as you said, very heartwarming. Thank you so much for it and hope you enjoy your evening. It's late Friday night for you. Thanks for staying up and addressing the audience. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. And as I open, I'll lift my hands up to you all and say, Haichka, Haichka, thank you for Heichka. honoring me with your engagement. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. See you. All right, everybody. So I, I'm sure you all agree what a lovely session that was, right? So we look forward to our, next, to our next session, which is equally going to be amazing, right? So I'm going to introduce the panelists to you now. Uh, before that, I would like to talk about a little brief about what this discussion is, you know, centering around. The primary purpose of schools is to sponsor learning. We know that students learn best when trying to do things that are challenging and of deep interest to them, something like what we just heard. Reflecting the close interplay of the emotional and cognition and the development of capacity. Modern research from neurosciences suggests that active engagement is a prerequisite for the changes in brain circuitry that are thought to underlie learning. In educational terms, this suggests that passively sitting in a classroom, hearing a teacher lecture will not necessarily lead to learning. Conversely, Active engagement with educational material within or outside of school will support learning, something that we just heard from Trevor. We have with us a distinguished panel to discuss their insights and learnings on this process of inquiry. I take immense pleasure in introducing the plan panelists to you. Our first panelist is Christopher Frost. He's fondly known as Chris. Chris is currently the deputy head of school at Tokyo International School, Japan. He's an experienced IB primary years program workshop leader, visiting team leader, IB consultant, and online IB workshop facilitator. Chris has facilitated numerous teacher training events for IB teachers across the Asia Pacific region. Chris consults with schools on behalf of the IB. He has contributed to the IB PYP program development by submitting numerous examples on approaches to teaching and learning. Outside of the IB, Chris has facilitated workshops for Yerkos schools and the Association of International Schools in Africa. He is also a CIS and NIASC accreditation team member and has worked with fieldwork education writing curriculum for the international primary curriculum. Thank you, Chris, for being on the panel. A warm welcome to you. Our next panelist is Abhimanyu Das Gupta. Abhimanyu has been an educator since 1999. He has been working with IB programs since 2004, and that includes 17 years at residential schools. Abhimanyu has worked in a range of roles, homeroom teacher, grade level coordinator, PYP coordinator, and head of primary. At present, Abhimanyu is the PYP coordinator at the Aga Khan Academy, Hyderabad. Outside of his profession, Abhimanyu is passionate about nature and loves dogs. Thanks Abhimanyu for taking your time out to be a part of the session. A warm welcome to you. Introducing our third panelist for the session, Carla Swinehart. Carla is an experienced educator with 12 years of PYP experience. Carla has worked in a variety of roles in PYP schools across four countries. At present, Carla is the PYP coordinator at Mahindra International School in Pune, India. An inquirer and a lifelong learner, she thrives on collaboration, diverse perspectives and discovering new learning. She is an active member of IBEN as a team visitor and workshop leader. Thank you, Carla, for being on the panel. Welcome. Our moderator for this session will be Sita Murthy. For participants who attended yesterday evening yesterday evening's panel discussion will remember Sita was one of the panelists. Sita Murthy currently serves as the director of education Silver Oaks International Schools. Silver Oaks International has schools in Hyderabad, Vishakha Patnam, and Bangalore. 
She also serves as President Heads Association of IB World Schools India. She is also the Vice Chairperson for the CBSE Schools Association Hyderabad. Three decades of teaching experience in different geographies of India makes her a lifelong learner. With her experience, she blends national and international goals of education in all her endeavors within and outside India. She regularly speaks at TEDx events and is an active blogger where she voices her perspectives on bringing a learning revolution. Sita Murthy is an avid trekker and frequently challenges her endurance limits in the Himalayas. She has trekked up to 14,000 feet and I'm sure she's already planning her next trek to go higher. Thank you, Sita, for being on this panel. Welcome to you too. With that round of introductions, I will now hand the floor over to Sita and the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Soumya. That was a wonderful introduction and I'm so glad to have such fantastic panelists here. After Trevor's keynote, to set the same kind of excitement and enthusiasm in what inquiry means to all of us, thousand plus people here now, and another thousand maybe on the YouTube. It's a huge responsibility, but I am very confident that the three panelists will bring a lot of insight and a lot of takeaways. So I think I will begin with understanding why we are talking about inquiry in PYP? Is it because that we want to be, catch them young, develop that culture, cultivate that culture of learning through, through inquiry? Or is it because learning through inquiry will enhance and enrich the learning years from the day one of formal schooling? Or is it because inquiry enables constructivism and enables every child to deeply involve, engage in the learning. We will wait to hear all these things from our panelists. So I will begin asking from Christopher Frost. Christopher, from the land of rising sun, how are you doing? How is the sun shining brightly over there, right here in Hyderabad in India? It's already up above us right now. My first question to you, Christopher, would be from your blogs. I went through your blogs and Trust me, mind blowing. I, I really like the kind of perspectives that you pack into each of your blog posts. And I wish I have a day or two to listen to you, not just one hour session. Nevertheless, from your blogs, I gather a range of perspectives on inquiry based learning. Trevor said this so many times in his talk, and it looks like I'm taking cue from him. But my question to you is. What does an inquiry look like, feel like, and sound like in a classroom? Okay. Well, thank, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, really exciting, so thanks, everybody. Um, I, I guess if we were doing this in the right way, I, I would be asking the audience that question, wouldn't I? You said earlier on that you know, passive listening isn't, isn't what inquiry is all about. So let's just for a second think about that as an audience. What might inquiry learning sound like? What might it look like? What might it feel like? Just think that to yourself. And you talked about my blogs and um, I, I certainly don't feel I'm a Trevor McKenzie. I, <laughs> but, I, but I do like the, the act of inquiry and, I, and I'm often questioning, including questioning the IB itself, because I think it would be ironic if we didn't question the IB, right? because the IB is all about inquiry. So if we're not being, um, if we're not being sort of skeptical and uh, provocative, then we're not being inquiry based. So to answer your question, uh, which was, what does it sound like, feel like, uh, okay. and, and look like? And in my opinion, uh, which I think people have said earlier on is that inquiry is the methodology of constructivist learning. So put very simply, Inquiry is anything that we do as a learner or as a teacher to increase quality thinking. It's that simple. So whatever we do, if it increases thinking, then it's inquiry, in my, my humble opinion. So how might that look? Uh, I mean, inquiry is, is sort of tension, critical thinking, predicting, debating, theorizing, skepticism, cognitive dissonance, what you call about. So it may be a child thinking it may be them writing down it may be them discussing their, their argument with somebody it could be 
It, it could be them in awe of something or observing closely. It's something that shows that they're engaged. Have I talked too much? Or no, no, I think, but we still want to hear more what you think inquiry should look like in a classroom. So I, I think it can, I think it varies. So I think that often, often we think about inquiry as just as um, just children collaborating, for example. Uh, I would say that that is one aspect of inquiry because it's that's how it might look lively and um, yeah. lots of discussion. Because if you do have cognitive dissonance, so you do have a perspective to share, or you do, or you are feeling skeptical, yeah. then you would more likely to have a conversation, discuss it. However, on the other side, there are introverted kids who may well be not the sort of child who wants to share their uh, their point of view or overtly, or indeed there's cultures like that. Japan is one of them where it's not cultural to be quite so in your face and discussing. So I think that inquiry depends on the individual as well, how it looks. Um, I think that you might get an introvert who's thinking very, very carefully and, and sort of constructing, constructing meaning within their, their own head, as well as being lively and constructing meaning um, in that sort of social constructivist sense. So it's, it, it's a huge range of things. It's a stance. I don't believe it can be summarized in, a, in, a, in, a, in an easy checklist that this is inquiry and this isn't inquiry. My question is, is it is what you're doing encouraging all of the children in your class to be thinking? Mm -hmm. If it is, then I would argue it's inquiry. Yes. Okay. Wonderful. And I'm glad you said about the culture part of it because each cultural context has a certain way of interacting with children. Like if you take the Asian context or the Indian context, prior to PYP or the inquiry-based learning, generally the culture in a classroom is the teacher is the center of the stage and the children are the recipients. And with PYP, there is a paradigm shift that, you know, teacher is no longer the sage on the stage. She has to be the actor on the side to help all the participants, the learners get active. So it, it was such a paradigm shift. I remember 13 years back when we took the PYP flight, I remember what a difficult um, stance it was that, we as teachers are not as important as learners being so important in the classroom. So, but then I think everybody began to take the flight and it's such a beautiful journey now. Carla, I come to you now. As an IBIN, as a workshop leader, you lead workshops to enable teachers to, uh, you know, develop that inquiry-based learning in the classroom. What do you think teachers need to have as skills or capacities to create inquiry-based learning? Thank you, Sita, and thank you to my fellow panelists, Chris and Abhi, and Saibsa and Neve Academy as well. So a few thoughts around this. Um, the first one is what's been said, kind of inquiry stance. I heard Chris say inquiry stance and inquiry mindset using Trevor's word. And for me to expand on that a bit, it's not just professional, it's personal. So this permeates, this is the way you function uh, in an inquiry stance throughout your life. And I think um, our students know when our curiosity and our personal inquiry is genuine and authentic, they can tell right away. And we have that genuine desire to learn that we're also a lifelong learner and who takes on inquiry in many different ways. And we can do this, you know, in our personal lives, but in a professional life, I think as Ivan as well, we can look to do this. Do we engage in the inquiry process through looking at research and professional literature and have that passion to improve in our teaching? At our school, one way we've done this is played with the appraisal process. Some schools call it differently, but we call it the appraisal process. And we have a group of teachers developing their own personal inquiry for the year, going through an inquiry cycle. We've co-constructed a solo taxonomy to self-assess that inquiry. So that's one way we could do that in our professional lives, formally and informally. So the first really is this inquiry stance and inquiry mindset. The second one I feel really strongly about, and it's a commitment and an ability to reflect. Um, a commitment, commitment can be there, but sometimes the ability is, is challenging. And we know in the PYP, ongoing reflection is a key part of our program. And reflection is often one of the hardest things to 
you know, teach those different skills of reflection to our students. So if we as teachers are able to reflect uh, honestly um, and accurately, but also, you know, we can wallow in kind of the failures that we have because that happens and that's fine. But if we take through that reflection process, it has to be from an action-based stance, I feel. So we have that reflection process of honest and accurate reflection and then take it further and really being realistically optimistic in that reflection process. When I think of how tools we can reflect with, I think of the IB graphic um, on the principles into practice under inquiry, there's those blue boxes. They really stand out to you. They're 20 boxes yeah. and that can easily be turned and flipped into a reflection tool. Um, Trevor has a continuum in his book from novice to master. Kimberly Mitchell has an inquiry self uh, survey. Of course, Kath Murdoch has her core principles, questions, and lots of lists and things we can look at for further skills there. So the inquiry mindset, the commitment and ability to reflect. And the third one I'm, I'm really passionate about is language. So our use of language and teachers' use of language. Uh, Trevor mentioned talk, um, and, and I would phrase it as language. Language is the manifestation of our thoughts. Um, and so that thinking process of inquiry is really important. And uh, a great book is Choice Words by Peter H. Johnston. And it's not about inquiry, but it's about the power of language. So inquiry teachers talk in a certain way. Um, they're making visible their thinking processes and they're really um, choosing their words very carefully to create that culture. Language creates the culture of inquiry in the classroom and of course in the school. Um, the last one I wanted to mention really is this ability to be flexible, uh, yeah. to allow for uncertainty, to yeah. be open to new directions. Um, a lot of teachers want to control things and plan things, and, and planning is really important, but the ability to give up that control, allow for some messiness um, in strategic mm -hmm. ways in the classroom is another key, key one. You know, the, the skills can be developed, you know, the pedagogical approaches of visible thinking routines, all of those things, but for me, these really stand out. And I'd just like to end with um, Kath Murdoch said in her book, to quote her, uh, In the Power of Inquiry, she says, my hunch is that this question of what makes a great inquiry teacher will stay with me for the remainder of my career. Maybe an unanswerable question. <laughs> That's Thanks. so nice, Carla. Thank you so much for bringing in that. Because the teachers need to be reflective if they have to create that culture of inquiry in the classroom. Uh, and I'm sure that, you know, when we talk about the learner profile, the approaches to learning, it's the teacher who has to first inwardly look at, can, am I this? Can I do this? Can I be reflective? Do I know in how many different ways I can be reflective? Do I know what it means to interpret, uh, you know, different attributes of the learner profile? Yes, I think uh, an inquiry practitioner should first understand with herself or or himself, who am I? Can I do this? Can I create this environment? I, I always love that in every planner, we have we. How do we know? How do we? So it's not they and us, it is we together. So I think that's the best formula for an inquiry practitioner. Thanks for those insights, Carla. Uh, a, a good start to a good panel discussion now. And Abhimanyu, my good friend. Hello from Hyderabad to you too in Hyderabad. So Abhimanyu, I know from your Facebook post how much you love plants and I know your dogs also and I know your fetish for cooking too from your uh, my, uh, you know, CV I've gathered that. I want to hear from you and I'm sure the participants would like to hear from your experience. What's a good recipe for a good inquiry? A short, short recipe, which I don't think is there anywhere, but from you we'd like to hear. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me here and uh, formally embarrassing me by revealing all these secrets in front of 2000 people. Uh, but uh, yes, uh, you know, being an inquiry based educator is really like being a, you know, a chef in the kitchen. And uh, that's why I start off with the kitchen because the kitchen is our learning environment. Uh, you know, we want a good kitchen, we want the right equipment. We want it clean, we want it uh, available with resources, and it needs to be also safe and secure. So when we look at a learning environment uh, at our schools, uh, we do have a lot of these things in place, uh, but the kind of space we have to play around 
uh, both physical and uh, intellectual uh, and the kind of safety nets we have because uh, the learning environment is a place where we can make mistakes where students can make mistakes on their journey in inquiry uh, and teachers can too you know it should be a safe space for everyone to explore and um, like you mentioned that i'm really passionate about nature and i really believe in nature being a very important part of your learning environment in the classroom because there is so much wondering uh, that nature can provoke uh, in the minds of children and uh, it really makes us even more rooted as learners uh, with that i think we'll have to go to uh, you know uh, like any good recipe we need good ingredients so <clears throat> we need inquisitive and open-minded learners um, and this uh, calls for a good inquiry to take place when we have students who are naturally curious, who are sometimes uninhibited, uh, though we do face uh, different cultural implications to that. Uh, but, you know, to be able to have good learners is always a, a recipe for a good inquiry. And uh, facilitators, facilitators also who have those skills that Carla talked about, because uh, when, when a facilitator is himself or herself an inquirer, uh, a lifelong learner, a researcher, then that is the kind of facilitator, you know, who's going to be able to nurture that spirit of inquiry in the classroom. And uh, together, all of this, uh, you know, you need to try out different methods. Uh, yesterday, Monita talked about uh, liquid state and Carla also mentioned that, you know, we must be well planned, we must have a vision of where we want the inquiry to lead uh, towards. But uh, at the same time, we need to be in a liquid state. We need to be flexible. And I think uh, this last one year, uh, everyone has been uh, forced to be in that liquid state. Uh, even if we were not naturally flexible as professionals, as people, uh, I think the environment itself has uh, you know, imposed on us that requirement to be a good inquiry-based educator, to be flexible with our plans. And of course, there are various methods in the kitchen to use. So you can break, you can grill, you can fry, you can simmer, you can boil. So, uh, you know, good inquiry needs some simmering time. It needs some proofing time. And uh, you, you baking is usually a slow, pro slow process uh, where, uh, you know, the temperature is moderate and the time is extended. So a good inquiry is something that is unrushed. And uh, you know you allow for the ingredients to meld with each other in that warm environment. Um, sometimes also for a good inquiry, you might just have to let an idea simmer. There are a lot of ideas that come through a good inquiry, but sometimes you just have to put it on the back burner and let it simmer till uh, we are ready to address it. Um, and uh, you know sometimes you also have to test your ideas test your theories test your hypothesis uh, it's almost like you know a, a deep fry uh, pan where you just have to dunk all those uh, ideas you have and see what happens in, in under that uh, circumstance and uh, <clears throat> you can also have your peers self reflect when you're going through these processes And, you know, test how far uh, the meat is tender or the cooking is done uh, through your own self-assessments. And once you've done all of that, you must also be prepared that sometimes your cake might just burn. And uh, then you need to start from scratch. So this kind of a mindset uh, should, should really, uh, you know, create for a good recipe. And uh, at the end, uh, serve it with love and pride and uh, serve it fresh and hot. That's what I'd say. How wonderful, Abhi, when you were, I think that was a delightful recipe. And I'm sure each one of the process, the action involved in the cooking and baking is so relevant to what we do in the inquiry because inquiry is a, over a period of time that we do. It's not an overnight process. How beautifully you have, uh, you brought in the relation between patient patient inquiry and patient cooking. Uh, that was so delightful. Thank you so much, everybody, for that. So I'll now go to asking questions that have come from the participants. What I did was I combined a few of them 
and made them into broader questions. I'm sure with your experience, each one of you will give some insights for the participants for takeaways now. So my first question is uh, making inquiry authentic, guided, open, and creating pathways for student-led inquiry. How does one go about it? How do you make an authentic, guided, open inquiry? And how do you create pathways for students to lead those inquiries? We'd like to hear first from Chris, if you can share some insights into how do you create pathways for student-led inquiries? Okay, I'll, I'll start with this word agency and teachers, right? So we talk about um, agency, you need to have self-efficacy, you need to be able to feel you can do it. And I think that generally speaking, inquiry is such a, a it's seen as such a difficult concept that people often get worried about it and therefore we have to make it tangible for, for teachers. So in that sort of essence, I'm going to try and make it as tangible as possible. So, so I'm going to break down what you've said um, and, and just to say, how do you practically go about it? Would that be okay, Sita? Yes. Just, so I, I'm just going to make it a little bit more simple. How do you practically go about it? And, and this is in, just in my opinion, some of the big takeaways that I've learned. The, the first one is, uh, I think it's Ron Richard, or it might be David Perkins in, in, their, in one of their books says, a good question gets us all thinking. And if that's the case, once somebody asks a question, it becomes your question. So my first takeaway is the kids don't have to come up with all the questions is that if you are asking a profound question or you're giving a really interesting provocation, then you own it. Everybody owns it. Your question becomes my question. So I think that that is the first thing I would like to share is that you don't have to be worrying about the kids coming up with their own questions. You can have a great question and it becomes theirs if it's, if it's, uh, if it's uh, said in a provocative way. So the second one I would say is you don't have to answer the question. This is what I used to be obsessed with is thinking, right, I've got all of these questions. Now we've got to find the answer to them. And you would have questions, some of which are extremely difficult to answer that kids wouldn't even understand. Um, and I realized that if, if we're just wanting kids to question, then what we need to do and, and to think, because that's what inquiry is, then we just need to to cultivate their curiosity and their, their love of inquiry and questioning. So it's like, wow, great question, move on. Or we use uh, think boards in our school where you might say, so, hey, what are you thinking? And they write down on a post-it note. Uh, they take a post-it note and they, they would, I haven't got time to write and they would just stick it on there. Okay. Uh, you know, what are you thinking? What's your question? And they write it down, um, but you don't answer it. Maybe 20 minutes later, you just, now what are you thinking? What's your question? And you write it down and you wander around the classroom and you are uh, engaging with the kids and you're saying, wow, what a great question. I don't know. Or what a great question. Let's find out. Or what a great question. What can we do with it? So you, you're not worried about answering the question. That's my big takeaway is that it's getting them to question, getting them to verbalize their questions is getting them thinking. The third one is teasing out questions. So in the same way with this thought board, you might be getting them, getting kids just to write down what they're thinking rather than what they're questioning. And maybe they're thinking something and you're turning that into a question. So let's uh, I try and trying to think of an example. Let's say that if we are investigating, we've got a ball of ice and you've got some salt over the top and you're doing some kind of scientific inquiry. I've just thought that on the top of my head. You might be, what are you thinking? And or what are you noticing? And they might write down something like, I think the ice is, the ice is being melted by the salt. You could walk around and say, oh, Sita thinks the ice is being melted by the salt. And then you turn it into a question. Does salt melt ice? And then that becomes the question. 
So you can go around and tease questions out of the kids, I think. And the third, the fourth and final one um, is that there are some questions that are productive and some that are unproductive. Some that just get kids to think and some that you can actually do something with. And you need to be able to sort questions into productive and unproductive with still honoring them because kids pose questions for lots of different reasons. Kids pose questions because they want to impress you. They don't necessarily want the answer. Kids pose questions because they want to know the answer, but they wouldn't necessarily ever understand the answer. An example I get from my own son, who's five, I'm an old dad, you know, like, uh, why is the sky blue or something like that? He's never going to understand, even if I could explain it to him. So there are some questions that are productive and can be investigated. And there are some questions that are unproductive that you just need to acknowledge. So with the unproductive ones, great. You know, I have no idea why the sky is blue, uh, but wonderful for noticing that it is blue. And then there are other ones that you could you could make productive. And I, I read this book, I can't remember what it's called. I think it, but it's a very simple book by, by a, um, I'll, I'll try and find it and send it to you later for, for people. But um, the author is somebody called Jelly. That's all I remember. And she talks about this notion of productive and unproductive questions. So for example, um, a child might ask, why, is, uh, why are plants green? And of course there's chlorophyll and there's all these reasons for their being green, but if you're seven, you're never gonna understand. So she would suggest that you say, I, I don't know, oh, but are all plants green? And then you have it open up to a date and that becomes your question. That's something they can investigate. Are the insides of plants green? Yes, they are. No, they're not. Yes, they are. No, they're not. Oh, Sita says they're not. What do you think? Sita, are all plants green? Or, you know, are the insides of plants blue? That's what Sita is saying. So you, you've, you tease out questions that are investigatable. Um, so that's me. That's me done for now. So it's a good question gets us all thinking. It doesn't have to be from the kids. You don't have to answer the question. That's something you can stop worrying about. Uh, uh, you can tease out questions by just going around and listening and turning them into questions. And there are productive and unproductive questions. The productive ones, some of them you can follow and the unproductive ones you can acknowledge but not necessarily have to follow. Wonderful. So it's essentially the art of questioning, the art of provocation that you feel are uh, good pathways for a good inquiry. Wonderful, uh, Chris. I think I enjoyed listening to you thoroughly. Carla, would you also like to give some insights into, into this? You know, leading students into authentic or guided or open inquiries. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I like that productive um, versus unproductive. That's got me thinking. That's wonderful. Um, I think the way I'll approach this question is just to tease apart those four words that you used in the question. So the first one was authentic. Um, and I think we do this, you know, by knowing our students. I'm thinking particularly of early years, but I think Garrison's example shows us, you know, how important it is that we need to know our students and that they're at the center. And this is the time to really walk the talk, I think, and put these principles into practice. So in authentic ways that we go around this is, especially in virtual learning, is exit tickets, um, really reflecting with the kids on what's working, what's not working, what do they like, um, what motivates us, really knowing what the kids are interested in inquiring into, because that's going to be authentic and that's also motivational. I think we need to be moving from, uh, you know, we need to move from local to global. So often with early years, it's, you know, what's, what do I want to inquire? What's immediately in my environment? As we get older, one way is to link things to the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which of course many schools do. Um, and I think another way to make it authentic is that design cycle um, that we have that empathize stage where we really take the time to, um, to unpack that with students and see what's happening in our environment and what sparks our curiosity um, and those questions kind of Chris was talking about. So uh, those are some of my thoughts around authentic. Um, the guided aspect is really allowing for that freedom, but having different levels of structure in place. And I think Trevor spoke to that about the scaffolding we need um, and some students maybe you know, building up those skills. 
So um, allowing that freedom for sure, but having important scaffolding levels. We've been playing with this um, in our passion project at the school I'm at, and we've had different levels of success. And again, we're playing with it, which is really fun to see what's most successful to allow those pathways. Uh, the word open, so making sure that it's conceptual and not limited to topics and really going with their interests. If it's kind of out there, allowing that inquiry to happen, if there's a conceptual link to the unit, um, but it's an inquiry they're doing within the unit, I think as long as we can make those conceptual links, um, those ATL links perhaps, um, that's also okay. Mm -hmm. And I think the last one on creating those pathways is really around the design of engagements, the design of questions, what Chris was talking about, um, and going with pathways that emerge. <laughs> We pre-think and pre-plan pathways we think might emerge, but we don't know. And if we're really giving that agency to learners, there will be unexpected pathways. And that ability, that art and science of being able to go with that emerging pathway, but um, you know, an experienced and skilled PYP teacher is able to allow that to happen and be able to weave aspects of the program through that in terms of the, the concepts, the learner profile and the skills, I would say. So creating those um, pathways is I think through the design and the scaffolding um, as well. Those are some of my thoughts. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm sure uh, uh, the teachers will, uh, when they start reflecting, is this a guided inquiry? Am I enabling student initiated inquiry? Is it a structured inquiry that this is a direction I want my students to follow? When the teacher is reflective, and I'm sure she will set the pathway very clearly for the learners also. Thank you for that. Abhimanyu, can I ask you this question on approaches to learning? They've become such key uh, tools in enabling a learner to be an inquirer. How, what do you suggest the role and development of approaches to learning and inquiry? Should they be happening like how Trevor was saying, it should be a calendared uh, you know, process where this month is this skill and this month. What is your take on the role and development of approaches to learning? So, uh, you know, I was really fortunate to began my career 22 years back at a Krishnamurti Foundation School. And J. Krishnamurti is, is uh, in, 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 a, in many ways, uh, the father of inquiry and education in an Indian context. Uh, he was, uh, he, he's all about, his philosophy is all about an inquiring mind. Um, and uh, I just wanted to start by sharing a quote by him, uh, which will kind of uh, resonate with what Chris was also talking about. He says that when inquiry is suppressed by previous knowledge or by the authority and experience of another, then learning becomes mere imitation. And imitation causes a human being to repeat what is learned without experiencing it. And uh, why I'm sharing this is because, yes, it is a skill. Uh, it is something that we can do. Uh, it is really learning to do something. Uh, but, you know, uh, the shift in, is actually brought about by the introduction of the word approaches. And, uh, you know, it's no longer... Uh, especially in the PYP, it's no longer about, you know, learning to write or learning to speak or learning to uh, even inquire, those kind of things. But it, it is really skills that the IB mission is talking about. We want students to be able to, you know, apply this uh, inquiry-based approach to their real life. It is not something that should be contained in the classroom. It is something that they need to apply. So that's why I think the role of approaches to learning uh, becomes very, very uh, important. And it expands the vision that the IB had in, in terms of transdisciplinary skills to what it has become today in terms of approaches to learning. So I think that's a very important clarification uh, uh, in my mind when uh, this term was uh, shared, is that uh, it, it is really about becoming that lifelong learner and knowing what to do, when to do, what's appropriate, how do I find out things and all of that. Uh, and of course, I'd like to refer to Trevor's uh, sketch note uh, on uh, the development of the uh, skill uh, when he looks at the sketch note using the analogy of the swimming pool. So, you know, uh, we all 
have certain innate strengths and skills and capabilities and we all have a lot of skills and capabilities uh, that are at a very basic or a rudimentary level so uh, we might be anywhere on that continuum which is why i feel that you know you can't have a day to celebrate the skills or a act an activity to you know only highlight on the skills it needs to breathe into the learning process it needs to be an integral element of inquiry and uh, i just would like to you know uh, ask all the participants to reflect uh, using a real life example from their life that when we are budgeting uh, you know we are not just integrating our understanding of math or applying our skills of language and economics and business and even the human element through social studies how do we budget how much can i spend uh, am, am i spending on environmental environmentally friendly products or you know am i going to generate more waste <clears throat> is uh, well being involved uh, in my budget am i tense about the finances or am i just going to go out for some retail therapy so there's of course a lot of uh, you know transdisciplinary uh, application there but uh, when we look at you know uh, really the approaches to learning uh, how are we really budgeting what is that process we are following not just what we are planning but how are we planning uh, i think the introduction of the atls actually uh enhances the quality of what we are doing it sets apart uh, a good budget from a not so good budget so uh, in terms of you know developing it it's important that we use a lot of reflection and assessments uh, which are ongoing so students uh, can assess themselves on a continuum it's good to you know have them reflect uh, maybe on a weekly basis that what is my skill uh, what is the skill that i'm going to focus on this week and how do i do how did i do at the end of the week and evaluate themselves uh, a teacher could use uh, skills to actually give feedback to students rather than saying that you know your pre presentation had all the necessary knowledge and content uh, it's probably important to say that your re thorough research reflected through your presentation so it's just bringing about that change in mindset so that we are focusing more on the approaches and not just on the skills and of course the portfolio and i think with online learning a lot of us are using digital portfolios whether it's manage bag seesaw or toddle and i think the portfolio is a great place to actually celebrate the progress of these skills so you know how are students reflecting how are they managing their time how are they communicating uh, how are they thinking all of that can be very beautifully documented through a portfolio so i th i think you know using a range of strategies and to use it at every possible opportunity will help integrate uh, skills and as an approach to learning as an approach to inquiry beautiful i'm i'm so glad you brought out the difference between skill and approaches to learning the, the moment you say approach to learning it is so intrinsic it is so purpose oriented when you say skill it's all about doing something externally i'm so glad you brought out that difference and how privileged you are to have started with jiddu krishnamurthy's uh, philosophy because art of questioning is something that he promotes and promoted in his education chris i'd like to hear from you your um, perspectives on approaches to learning and how can a pyp practitioner make it more effective in her or his classroom well i agree with i actually didn't see trevor's webinar i'm sorry i came on late but i agree uh, that sort of cross cross referencing and trying to trying to achieve every single skill at a certain time isn't very useful in my experience we too often we've put these skills down on planners and then we've not really done anything other than write them on a planner we haven't managed to bring them alive so i agree with that i think it's more about um having a culture like abby was talking about learning to learn about lifelong learning and it's and it's in culture in this so it's um it's highlighting what we value in in our classrooms so authors such as art costa have written about habits of mind um and guy claxton's written about learning power kath murdoch's talked about these learning assets it's a, they all agree that these dispositions or skills whatever you want to call them 
you want to make sure that they are uh, tangible to the kids, that the kids realize that they're important and that they are thinking not only about what they're learning, but how they're learning. So um, what we do in our school is we, where we group them. Uh, we, we, we learned this from Kath Murdoch's book. So we have sort of lower primary and upper primary skills. Um, and we get uh, we, we make cards to make them tangible that the that the kids and the teachers can 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 pick up and use so they can be actually picking and thinking about the skill that they're using or or writing them down on uh, their their boards that they've got so they're sort of addressing them. Um, but it all or this notion of uh, split screen teaching, which is when you uh, you write about what we're learning up on your whiteboard or, or blackboard and how we're learning up on the whiteboard and blackboard. So the kids are thinking about how they're learning as well as what they're learning. And they're reflecting on that. So it's making a fuss about what we value in short. It's, make, it's bringing it alive, making a fuss about what we value. And we've always done this as teachers, I think, but, it's, but as we've become inquiry practice practitioners, we've now sort of raised the emphasis on that. Thanks for that, Chris. Uh, so it just makes me feel like uh, approaches to learning or a lifestyle for a learner, for a lifelong learner, something like that. Uh, Carla, there were many questions from the participants about addressing differentiation and assessments in inquiry. What are the challenges and what are the possibilities? I'd like to hear from you. Sure. Um, well, differentiation and assessment go hand in hand. And of course, to plan inquiry or anything in the classroom, we need ongoing continuous assessment. And we need a range of tools. So that being said, I am always realistically optimistic. So I'm going to mention a few challenges and talk more of the possibilities because the possibilities are really exciting. Um, some of the challenges, I think number one is we have a huge range of learners in our classroom that has been and always will be there. It won't change. And, um, you, know, yeah. you know, assessment and differentiation obviously address that. Time is another thing. Um, and the logistics of, you know, some of these possibilities I'll talk about, I understand are a challenge. But I think the more we play with them and experiment and fail forward, um, the more these possibilities will become a reality. So, so possibilities is really um, this, the concept which has been mentioned this morning of co-construction of assessment criteria. And I know PYP practitioners everywhere are, are playing with this, but it really immediate, uh, immediately allows for differentiation. You're getting the voice, you're seeing this. For example, last week, I was working with our P5 team and co-constructing assessment criteria for the exhibition. And because we're in virtual mode, we did it via a form uh, first, and then we met and had a jam board and it's, it's a whole process, but um, the data that we collected first on the Google form was really different than what I had had in my mind. And I think that's a really good example of getting that student voice into, so, so we're taking that input and we're, we're changing some of the ideas there. So that co-construction, and that's a huge um, thing you could do a whole you know, um, professional development on. Um, so building that repertoire of assessment tools is gonna help you differentiate as well. Um, we've been exploring Jo Bowler and her um, course, Mathematical Mindsets and How to Learn Math for Teachers. And so opening tasks, um, mixed ability groupings, and this concept of a low floor, high ceiling task is really important for um, differentiation happening automatically, as well as as an assessment tool as well. Um, goal setting is another one, uh, interesting possibility to play with. Um, and students really self-assessing against those goals. So personalized goals um, that can easily be dif differentiated. And then it, it raises the level of self-assessment, of course. Um, within assessment, choice is really key. So building in choice, obviously, as much as possible. And the, the last one I wanna mention is the, the elevation of self-assessment and peer assessment. We've seen, especially in virtual learning, we, we did them before, but really focusing on that self-assessment because they're not, they're not with us in, in the school and we're mainly asynchronous at our school. So when they're involved in that assessment process, we're building that assessment capability of the learners as well. So through this differentiation and assessment, we also wanna be building, building those capabilities in the learners as well. So um, 
using that and obviously co-constructing um, self-assessments and co-constructing peer assessments as well are some of the great possibilities that we have in this area. Thanks, Carla. I'm sure the participants uh, have a lot of takeaways from your ideas. Abhimanyu, can we hear from you now? Differentiation and assessments in inquiry, challenges right. and Right. So I agree with uh, all that Kala shared. And of course, uh, time is always a challenge. Uh, and uh, thankfully, we are completely synchronous with our learning. Um, but still, you know, we feel that uh, there's not enough time. And there's only that much you can exert them online in front of the screen. Uh, so, uh, but even in a face-to-face -face setting, I think uh, the amount of time uh, assessments uh, and differentiation, uh, I won't say need, but I would say deserve, uh, is sometimes that are limited in, uh, in practical situations. But uh, another challenge is also sometimes having the right kind of team and mindset. Uh, so yes, we do have policies in place to look at inclusion and assessment. Uh, but how do we really live those policies in practice? And uh, I think sometimes it's also not easy to you know, have the right team uh, in, in supporting these learners or even to have the right mindset for differentiation because differentiation is not just giving three different tasks to three different groups. Uh, that's a very basic understanding of differentiation. It's far more uh, similar to uh, Garrison's tale uh, yeah. is really for that teacher to be able to understand, uh, you know, the strengths and capabilities of each learner and utilize their own passions and interests to engage them into the learning. So, uh, you know, that, that requires a kind of, uh, you can be a great teacher, but it also requires a compassionate heart. And uh, I, I think that that's uh, not always easy to find a mix of these qualities. Uh, and uh, when you have that kind of a team, uh, are we still planning authentic assessments? Is it uh, just to, you know, kind of fill up our records or is it really, like Chris is saying, to monitor how they are progressing through their learning, to turn that question around, to be able to propose a different kind of inquiry, to give them that freedom to, you know, do a personal inquiry? Are we really being authentic uh, to differentiation and assessment? But of course, uh, you know, choice, voice, and ownership, and agency has uh, highlighted uh, the possibilities with uh, assessments and differentiation. And I think a lot of our schools are now exploring that. I, I won't say that we have all understood it and we are all implementing it with uh, the same in the same degree. But I think we are all on that journey of you know utilizing agency, like Allah shared, co-constructing assessment tasks or co-constructing uh, uh, central idea or even co-constructing a la learning engagement at our school. We've been you know, able to do a lot of that this time with the exhibition. And uh, I think using technology helps like uh, Flipgrid is a great tool to actually uh, give students that uh, ownership, to give students that freedom and choice to express their understanding. And uh, even, you know, we use Padlet, we use uh, other uh, options of polls and surveys like Google Forms and Mentimeter so that students are absolutely involved in their own learning and assessment. Um, yeah, I think that that's what uh, I would like to add. Wonderful. Thank you, Abhimanyu, for that. Uh, considering the time, Soumya, would you like to, uh, would you like me to continue with the question that I already have? or take the questions from the chat box here. Uh, yes, Sita. It will be good if you take a couple of questions because we actually have only one more minute left. That's why so I Maybe thought a couple I should of do. minutes because Shall many of our I take the questions from the chat yes. box then? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, all right. So, there is one question here about how much time should we have for everyday class? So, what I mean is sometimes but limited, no, 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 I don't think this is a right one here. Um, there is Preeti Ramchandran asking, what are the effective measures, best practices to enable inquiry approach in, in children who are introvertish and slow learners? Yeah, I mean, learn, who need additional attention. Chris, can we hear from you? How do you encourage children who are not very uh, 
overtly participated. I would just go back as that inquiry is a, is a stance that you want children to think. So the, you want, you're trying to get those same children to think. So you're, you're, it's mm -hmm. your, your, for example, you're, you're giving them pictures to look at and to be provoking them in that sense. So it, it's just how, it's, you, as a teacher, you just have to ask yourself, are you making that child think? And yep. yep, there are times when inquiry doesn't work and you have to just explain something to a child. And then, but then when they're explaining it back to you, you're there thinking. So I would just say, are you making them think? That's as simple as that. Um, Sunita Dubey is asking this question to you, Carla. Can you share some strategies for self and peer assessment on a virtual platform? Um, sure, we've done a lot of developing and co-constructing, most of them are co-constructed, um, checklists. I found that's been pretty, um, pretty effective. So th the tool can be used in any, in any case for inquiry or anything, um, but a checklist is, is really good to co-construct. And also um, there's a few examples. I'll be sharing them in the ATL sec session this afternoon. I'll be giving visuals and things. Um, we have a great example for music, for example, of integrating the ATL and then, you know, a range like smiley faces and um, self-assessing in that way. Peer assessment has been really um, easy to facilitate on Seesaw, for example. Uh, we use Seesaw, but many other platforms would work like Flipgrid that Abby mentioned. So commenting on others' work and having a very specific uh, question that they're answering to um, on their peers' work, giving voice comments and, um, you know, learning those skills of feedback and feed forward as well. Those are a few examples. Okay, so the last question goes to Abhimanyu from Aditi Mishra. Abhimanyu, you are said to be ready to start over in case of something not working. Is there any strategy or tool for unlearning? Uh, <clears throat> I think uh, everything depends on time. In life, there are certain things, certain mistakes you can make and you can have another go. Certain mistakes you don't get another chance to correct. So it all depends on time. If you have the time within your inquiry to kind of relook at something, it's always good because you're also modeling that uh, stance to the students of reflecting on your own work and revisiting and redoing. Uh, and that kind of that skill takes them forward all the way to diploma. Uh, and uh, in terms of being an educator, I think really to have a reflective and open mind, because unless you're reflective, you might not realize your cake is burnt. Uh, and if you're open to it and not get frustrated that, oh, I burned my cake, what do I do now? I'm a failure, that's not going to help. You need to be patient with yourself, have an open mind and say, no, I'm going to give it another go. Yeah. All the inquirers in the chat box, you have wonderful questions. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to answer all of them. With such fantastic panelists, never time is enough. But nevertheless, thank you so much, Chris, Carla, and Abhimanyu for bringing in so many insights with your great experience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Over to you, Samya. <laughs> thank you, Sita. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the session. A big thank you to Carla, Chris, Abhi, Sita for joining us today and really enriching and letting us, you know, giving a great insight into all their personal stories and uh, sharing lovely experiences, strategies and tools that we really look forward to. Thank you so much for sharing your pathways, whether it is to do with a recipe or a scientific inquiry. And it's, I agree with you, it's not about answering all the questions that students, you know, come up with, but it's important to get them to think and ask them to formulate it themselves, right? Whether it's going to be productive or not, but it's great, it's very important that we get students to do the work. We now take a short break, and after the break, we have independent breakout sessions running in parallel. Request you to join the respective Zoom links that's given very clearly in the schedule uh, for all these breakouts. And uh, thank you, audience, and we will be back on the same webinar link at 12.45 after the lunch break for Tanya's, Tanya Mansfield's plenary session on rethinking assessments. So enjoy your break and let's see you soon. Bye-bye.